Good morning everybody, we were trying to derive the time domain equations for uh, a thermoacoustic instability in a Ricci tube and we are trying to write it in operator or matrix form so that we can do not just numerical simulations but just analysis of the stability with those equations. So uh, what I would try to what, what we try to do is to uh, have separate out the linear and non-linear term because we had a delayed differential equation but then we expanded the term u of t minus tau in terms of uh, the Taylor series and we uh, uh, kept the linear term and, and then uh, or if you have a non-linearities then you can have the non-linear terms also if for small time delays we can uh, make the assumption that only that uh, uh, first term in tau is there and then what we did is to rewrite the equations in such a way that we can use the dynamical systems approach. So what we had in the end was the following we had dt plus l times chi plus this, this what did they call this just last time B L okay and so this is the non linear uh, ODEs set of ODEs and uh, this is the linear part and this is non-linear. So if we are linearizing, linearizing the equation then what we have is just so we can uh, uh, look at this equation and try to find the non-linear stability characteristics but then nonlinear equations are hard to solve and anything nonlinear is much harder to solve which is the reason why we do linearized approaches so we do have the linearized system here and we can see whether whatever we found from the earlier analysis is sufficient in the frequency domain or whether we are missing out anything because this is uh, this accounts for the transients as well okay so that's what we will do and uh, i will just assemble the full matrix just for convenience and you can check it um, or I mean when you program it you need the full matrix B L we derived expression for this A1, A2, A3 last time if you remember. just for the sake of completion I will write this matrix so B L equal to 0 minus 1 0 this is the first term the second term would be Okay, let me give some space where it is. Oh. I think I will not write this, it's not enough space. So the last term is minus beta 1 tau cos n pi xf and the term before is beta 1 
and then you will have zeros and you will have beta 2 cos 2 pi xf minus beta 2 tau cos uh, and last term would be So you would be able to take this. Sorry? Oh yeah, yeah, minus one. That's right. Absolutely right. So we can t take these terms and assemble this equation, and uh, we can. Um, so there's no big deal. I mean, it's just I just wanted to. Uh, this is what you would input your computer program when you construct your operator on the matrix. This is what you will give and then you can do all the operations like exponentiate the matrix, find the eigenvalues and blah, blah, blah. Um, everything can be done uh, peacefully, particularly in MATLAB it is uh, very optimized to do matrix operations, matrix and vector operations. So, there is nothing new in this, it is just rewriting this and we had assembled the individual terms yesterday. So, if there is a mistake please point out. So. B N L similarly will be so I will have one row of one row of zero and I will have alpha one cos I except so I will define alpha j equal to minus 3 fourth beta j. So, just for convenience uh, to write it easily otherwise you have to keep on writing 3 fourth every time. you would get a big operator like this. Just check one thing. A mistake here. Yeah? This should be. Yeah. This should be. Yeah. This should be. And, uh, <coughs>
sorry I made a mistake so this is right should be pi here and then the next one will have 2 pi and in the end n pi okay. okay so this is the details you can check this at home and uh, let me know if I made a mistake. Now uh, there is one more thing I want to discuss so this is a set of equations and you can scale them anyway right I mean you can uh, you have 5 equations you can always multiply the first equation by 2 second equation by 3 third equation by 0 0.1 fourth equation by some other number and so on. Uh, so you will get different chi's as uh, I mean you can get a different set of chi's so this is not really unique but uh, what is the uh, uh, what is the way to correctly scale the equations between themselves what would you think yeah it is normal we look for a norm of the system and 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 the norm of the system should represent some kind of physical energy so that is the idea. So we should look for the two norm of the system here perhaps so two norm of the system will be if chi consists of eta 1 eta 1 dot eta 2 eta dot 2 dot you square all of them and add that would be the norm in fact uh, sometimes that may not represent energy in this case it would not represent energy but you will have to divide the eta uh, eta dots by j pi and then you square and add it would actually represent the acoustic energy that which is something physical. So uh, we can take anything and uh, you can do any scaling that means scaling what I mean is relatively weighing different equations differently uh, if you remember when we are deriving the acoustic energy corollary and also when we derived the Rayleigh criteria we actually scale the equations we had you know we did not have energy as p prime squared plus u prime squared we had u prime squared was multiplied by half rho bar and you had half rho bar u prime squared and the uh, p prime squared had half p prime squared by rho bar c squared or something like that. So together they made the so one was kinetic energy the term going like square of velocity uh, the term going like square of pressure was the potential energy and together they made the acoustic energy. So why did we do that way so you I mean that was the appropriate scaling and then only if you did that scaling you will get the term. Uh, del dot p prime u prime you, you got p prime du by dx plus u prime dp dx together they became d by dx of p prime u prime and this kind of nice scaling would not be possible if one term was multiplied by something else and another term was multiplied by something else then these terms will hang there it will be something like times p prime u prime plus some other thing times u prime I mean something like times p prime du prime by dx plus some other uh, number times u prime dp prime by dx which together will not convert to a flux term like del dot p prime u. So we have to scale appropriately and uh, in the case of acoustic energy it is very simple but some other times it is like an art and some other uh, times uh, it may, have, may be possible to construct a 2 norm which is like the energy sometimes maybe not. So I think it is a very deep question I would not want to get into it but I will show you how to do it in principle how to change the equations okay. So, So we have this equation so what we can do is uh, let, let, let me rewrite this uh, and I multiply this by w so I will have w d k by d t equal to w b l and I will say w inverse w. I can always multiply anything by w inverse w because that is 1 so this together this is identity and sky but now it is peaceful w is a uh, weight matrix so its terms are constants okay so we can call w chi as chi normalized let us say so then you will get so 
this W chi all right now. And chi normalis is nothing but W chi. Of course, what weight to use that goes like the physics of the problem and sometimes it may be obvious, sometimes it is not obvious. But all I have done is to, uh, so if you do this, I mean you are eligible to do this, we can use any, any weight. But the, if the two norm of the uh, dynamic system that if that can measure the energy, then we can use lot of the machinery from uh, uh, linear algebra to study lot of things. So if we were to, I will give a simple example to be able to convert chi to something which measures the acoustic energy. So what I would do is my W would be 1, 0 and all zeros 1 over pi and I have 1, 1 over 2 pi, 1, 1 over n pi. So if I take this and multiplied by eta 1, eta 1 dot, eta n, eta n dot, what I would get would be eta 1, eta 1 dot by pi, eta 2, eta 2 dot over pi, eta n, eta n dot over pi. So, this if you, uh, sorry, it is 2 pi, this is n pi, thanks a lot. So, if you square all of these things and if you do 1 minute of algebra, you can show that it will go like, actually like acoustic energy. I will show that in detail another time. Oh yeah, thank you, there is a minus. B, L, B, L. Sorry, yeah, thank you, I, I. linear. And so what really matters is, is this operator normal or not normal, with n and plus, <laughs> but leave that there, yeah, we will use this, is it okay? So you can uh, try to do some algebra at home to see what does this stand for, eta squared plus eta dot squared over pi squared plus eta 2 squared plus eta 2 over 2 pi the whole squared, da, 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 eta n squared plus eta n dot squared over n pi squared, what does this mean and answer is it is acoustic energy, okay. So let me write this question. first one, the second one, write a linear and non-linear solver for solving this equations. So I think by now you are, after the first assignment you guys should be, uh, after solving the numerically standing wave numerically with Runge Kutta and all that and you should be knowing how to do this. You can use uh, fourth order Runge Kutta to integrate this equation both linear and, and non-linear but there is some other way you can actually solve the linear equation. Would you know? This equation is there another way of solving it other than numerically integrating it where chi is a vector. Minus beta yeah. So, uh, you can actually write a solution for this equation as <coughs> chi equal to whatever chi naught e power minus beta t. So, this is a closed form solution of that, but then 
what does this e power minus beta l t mean? Okay, so it is an exponential of a matrix. So, third question is look up what the exponential of a matrix means. You can look up any linear algebra book or perhaps you can see it in book on dynamical systems or you can probably see it in Wikipedia. This okay so far? So to summarize we have our dynamical system written here. So it is in the form d chi by dt plus f of chi equal to 0 and we have a linearized version and we have a nonlinear version and uh, the nonlinear version we split into linear and the nonlinear terms and the linear solution has a closed form solution of this form based on exp matrix exponential. Uh, if you cannot uh, find this I will answer it in the coming subsequent classes. The last point is you can normalize the equations by multi multiplying by a weight factor as shown here and what weight you choose depend on uh, the physics of the system and and to some extent it may be art uh, coming up with what is the energy of the system. In, in this case there is a clean energy definition of acoustic energy but in a more complicated system it may not be that trivially obvious. So I will pause for a minute and answer questions. What can I say about BL as in will it always be a normal matrix? Yeah, so that is the uh, next question. Uh, what, what do you think from that uh, or, or just can you just look at that expression in your book and, and, and what do you think? If, if beta ends where 0 and if psi, size were also 0, what will happen? Then it will be normal matrix, right? In fact, uh, if you look at your, it will just be, yeah, it will be normal matrix without uh, those terms. If there is no damping and if uh, if uh, yeah, those beta two and beta one, beta two, psi one, psi two, they are the ones which make the matrix non uh, non normal. So if you drop those terms, you can uh, a a transpose will be a transpose a. So but this is a non normal. So let's so that, that I'm going to answer that. That that's the next set of things. What other question you have? So the answer is uh, in the presence of unsteady heat release or in the presence of damping or if you had some other boundary conditions the uh, uh, the operator will be non normal in the absence of heat release and steady heat release and in the ab in, in and if with perfect boundary condition pressure is p prime is 0 or u prime is 0 then you would have uh, normal normal operator any other question okay so let's continue so uh, we wish to look at the uh, linear stability of the uh, system and uh, why is it so important. So we saw in this uh, we can see in the slide that if you uh, uh, if you have a uh, eigenvalues which are showing growth rate then system will uh, start spontaneously from some low amplitude and go towards instability and you will have exponential growth first okay eventually the nonlinear terms may come into play and you may uh, not your amplitudes may not grow indefinitely you will reach a kind of limit cycle. But you can also have a system which is shown here this is I must acknowledge Professor Zinn who gave me this notes he is a legend in the subject uh, he also was my advisor. So if you a system is stable and it will stay stable forever but if there are no perturbations but you perturb with the, with the amplitude here he has shown two perturbations this, is a, uh, this one p1 star p2 star you decayed from the system and this p3 star was high enough that the system went to limit cycle oscillations. So we want to look at this thing and the issue is whether this non-normal operator plays any role in this although this triggering is a non-linear phenomena. So yes, limit cycle oscillations, oscillations will be of the order of uh, the disturbing well, Yeah so the idea is that the, that was the previous idea that the threshold amplitude would be large enough large would be means something comparable to the limit cycle oscillation. So whether that is right I do not know that is what we are going to examine I mean I think uh, that was the previous concept but 
I think the recent findings of uh, our group has uh, overturned this actually. So, so we uh, saw in the earlier uh, problem the example given by McManus where we studied things based on eigenvalues. So, that was a very simple system where they, we just had a flame and a duct. So, that were the only components, but you can have more things like in a complicated burner you have fuel supply, air supply, each of them have its own impedances. So, you can uh, and you have burner, flame, combustor, whatever else and for each of the system you can write some input output equations or write a different equation for the entire system and construct a model and this in the combustion instability jargon is called uh, network analysis and we will do it in a similar fashion as we did that example problem of McManus et al. Uh, and uh, okay, there are different styles of doing it, but then it is in principle or in, uh, it is just a network model using or a model using normal modes and we look for the uh, unstable eigenvalues or we look for the eigenvalues which have uh, which show growth rate or decay rate and if you say if it is decaying the, the growth rate is negative we are happy we say the system is stable and if we have a growth rate which is posi positive then we have to worry because instability can happen and this is the approach and uh, the reasoning was that we are starting from low amplitude. So, linearized equations are sufficient to model the evolution. So, if you are an engineer we are taught to believe that below the amplitude of 10 percent everything is linear uh, some magic somebody some eleventh commandment or something I mean somebody said this and uh, somewhere and we are believing it and there is another crowd of people who believe that 5 percent is when everything is linear anything more will be, but between these two categories it includes all the engineers and uh, we have to see whether this is right or not. So, we have this equation omega is 2 pi f plus i alpha and uh, this is frequency f and alpha is the growth rate. So, if you write p prime is p hat e power i omega t we can substitute this omega in here and you will have a periodic part and the exponential growth or decay. So, this is the sum and substance of this. So, if you if you have all the alphas you have several eigenvalues if all of the alphas are negative then we will say a j ho or something I mean we, we say everything is stable and we can sleep in peace is that the case that is the issue. Now, there are this I think I told you about what is called triggering instability and the norm and the term predates the uh, non-linear dynamics uh, uh, as a subject because this non-linear dynamics formally became a subject in the 70s, 80s and, and so on whereas this term I mean triggering instability was uh, was coined in the 50s perhaps. So, you had these uh, rockets and they would be fired several times in the ground or in the air and some, some would be completely fine for 10 or 20 firings and maybe 21st one it just goes unstable and then again everything is fine and then and you know when you look at it sometimes some little bit of propellant broke off and came out through the nozzle momentarily creating a spike in the pressure and then bang the thing went unstable or something like that. And the uh, same kind of thing was seen in, in the gas turbine industries where you have combustors which are quiet and fine nice, but sometimes they just come on sometimes they do not depending on the background noise in the system. So, we are going to look at those systems and why linear stability theory fails to account for it and how you can deal with it. So, at the moment with the normal mode analysis we look at the imaginary part of the eigenvalue call it growth rate and if it is positive we worry about it if it, if it is negative we sleep with peace. So, but we are have to face this uh, non-linear instability. So, a system is non-linear un unstable if some finite amplitude does not necessarily uh, mean a all amplitude, but some finite amplitude linear stability means any amplitude it can be arbitrarily small it will still grow, but here it means some of the amplitudes so with some of the disturbance it can grow it need not grow with all disturbances. And the general idea was that for triggering instability the instability amplitude should be greater than a uh, threshold amplitude. So, this is uh, uh, data which I have uh, shown from uh, Matt Weave's thesis which are reproduced from Matt Weave's thesis. So, here we are having a reek tube like the horizontal reek tube which I showed uh, that was our reek tube, but Matt Weave have um, had similar reek tube and we increase the power given to the heater. So, you are measuring the input power and you come to 650 watts till then everything is quiet and fine and then you increase at the next power setting you have gone to uh, sorry uh, you follow the green line up to 1050 watts it is quiet. 
uh, you, you are quite here, quite here, quite here. And then at 1050 watts, if you increase the power above that, you go to instability here. And then you keep on staying in stability, but you cannot he heat up too much because the wire mesh will burn eventually if it is too much heat. So, till that place, and then you want to come back. So, you would think that if you come to 1050 watts, it should come back. No, it does not. You have to come back all the way, and only when you come to 650 watts, you are coming down. It is like if you mess up, do something and mess things up, if you stop doing it, you will not clean up, you have to do undo a lot of damage. So, that is what it is. So, this is like this is the forward path and this is the return path. So, this is called a hysteresis and if you speak to people working in nonlinear dynamics, they say hysteresis is a signature of subcritical bifurcations and it is a signature in such systems uh, triggering instability can happen. So, there is some kind of threshold line here again what is a line and what is the threshold we will debate later on, but if you in this region heated with small disturbances they will die down, but in this region they will grow. Okay. So, and, and the uh, amount of disturbance depends on where you are in this region. So, you can see that there is a big subcritical zone which is of the 40 percent of the power of the, at the half point and, and there it is possible that you can uh, trip the system, trigger the system to instability. Now, I give you the example of um, a family at 8 o'clock. Uh, man and woman going to work and the children are going to school and uh, like you can think about this as 7.30 and this is 8 if you plot time versus disturbance and beyond 8 you are unstable because they are not staying together at home. And in this region, so let us say we are far away like 7 o'clock if the kid spills coffee on father's shirt or mo mom's shirt, okay, father will go and take another shirt and, and there will be no serious problem. And, uh, and, and as you cross 7.30 am and let us say that is some critical time, then if the kid makes some breaks something big then there will be a disturbance, but if there is so it breaks some small thing it throws away it is eraser or cannot find something also small or, or spills a little bit coffee uh, it will be uh, it will die down, but if you make a big disturbances like tear away dad's papers or something and then you go to instability dad gets upset mom gets upset everything will go, but as you come closer towards 8 o'clock when everybody is supposed to leave. And even a small disturbances uh, can actually make people angry. You know, 7:58, uh, you spill coffee on that shirt, and he will get angry, and the kid will start crying. And once the kid starts crying, mom will get upset, and the school bus is there. The school bus is waiting. School bus honks, but you have to. Ch uh, the kid is just hysterical. By the time you pacify the kid and bring out to the school bus, the school bus has left. Now you have to drive to the school bus and drop them. So, uh, so this is this uh, hysteresis zone. Uh, where all this thing can happen. So, this is a, like a real life analogy of, of, of that, it is not a one to one analogy, but I hope you get the uh, uh, spirit of it. That is uh, I mean the same action under some other circumstances like 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock would not create any problem, but close to 8 o'clock when everybody has to go can create a problem. So, I, this is a calculated one, the earlier one was uh, experimental work. Uh, so, if you increase the heat of power, this k is some kind of non dimensionalized. Uh, so, let us not worry about it, but it represents the heat release rate, heat, the heat of power. So, if you increase the heat of power, you come till here and then you go to instability here. And of course, theoretically, you can increase the power as much as you want, there is no worry about heater burning and so on. Whereas, on, on, when you do the experiment, you have to see if the heat will burn off and so on. And you come back and you come here, and only then it will come back here. Okay. So, you cannot come back where you where you took off, you have to actually undo some more damage or something like that, you have to come back some more and only then you will reach a steady state. So, in the uh, language of dynamical system people, this point where, so this is the loss of linear stability. So, our linear stability will predict this because any solution is, uh, any, any solution, so there are actually solutions here, but they are unstable. You can have steady solution but it does not exist because beyond this heat of power any small disturbance will become unstable. So, uh, this half point is called the is also uh, uh, can be thought of as the loss of linear stability and this point is called fold, uh, fold point. I will uh, uh, teach a little bit specifically about bifurcation later, but at the moment we we can identify two points right. So, this is the linear stability loss of linear stability and this is the place where you 
uh, below this is always stable here there is a uh, region where in between these two powers you can be stable or unstable. So, that means there is some kind of basin boundary which separates these two solutions that is a limit cycle solution and there is a fixed point which is fixed point means everything is quiet or equilibrium point solution and you have some other solution which is high amplitude limit cycle and in bit so there is a basin boundary which separates this solutions from that solutions and of course the basin boundary is a surface because there are many uh, surface in the direction of this we have several dimensions for the system uh, and along some along so a limit cycle will lie on this uh, you should be able to find a limit cycle on this basin boundary but typically it will be an unstable limit cycle that means in principle the solution exists but you can't find it you can, the solution won't stay there because any small disturbance will perturb that. So, there is actually an unstable limit cycle lying there okay. So, this is a very brief way of uh, brief introduction to the dynamical systems way of representing it and I must emphasize that uh, this by, uh, this, these are non-linear phenomena limit cycle and triggering instability and, and so on and so forth. Are there any questions about things so far? Can we have some active controls which can uh, reduce, which can avoid these instabilities? Uh, as a tricky question, <coughs> within uh, uh, so you have a system which doesn't do anything. So, you cannot do anything control because control needs some measurement and then only you can control, but then there are controllers which can come on and uh, uh, when when some instability happens and if transient growth hap I mean if this growth happens and so on there are controllers which can uh, take care of it like I think LQG controller should be able to work there. Uh, yeah, you had a question. When we did that similarity transformation there, yeah. then uh, what, what do we say that some the debt of debt square of W should be 1 or something like that as in or is it just a normal transformation or is it some. No, I have this is uh, I am just multiplying by W and I am hoping that the two norm of this vector will go like acoustic energy or, or like some, some kind of energy of that particular system that is all and nothing more. Mathematically, what is the significance of that of that transformation? Oh, there's no. I mean, physically, there's no, because mathematically, I'm not altering anything, right? But we're changing the. As in, we can change the we can think of this as changing the uh, changing our basis for our x vector. So it, exactly. So you you are having not the basis. You change the coefficients of the basis functions. So you have. Uh, um, it is like changing the units along each thing or something. So, you are uh, you you find the energy as like a length of the vector, we are not changing the basis, we still use the same basis, but we are uh, 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 it is like we are stretching some coordinates or, something or shrinking some coordinates by weighing. That will be only when W is a diagonal multiplication. Not necessarily, I mean you can have, have W anything, I mean any W, but I can use any w and I can change this equation to this equation this does not depend on its diagonal. But the only changing the length that thing will happen only if w is diagonal and if it is not diagonal then it will then the whole basis vector itself will change and we get linear combinations of two. Yeah things. sure yeah so now now you in, in this <coughs> yeah we can change the uh, you are having linear combination you have uh, different directions for the we still use in our original thing sin and cos and all that, but then uh, it is just like uh, transforming the coordinates you are constructing new Eigen vectors or sorry new basis function as combination of those functions and then but you are still measuring the lengths with that and we are weighing those directions also uh, differently there is a possibility. So, you can just amplify you can use the same basis function and use um, which is what we are doing here, but just multiplying or shrinking or expanding, but you can also use combinations and find new directions both are okay. So, that that is mathematically physically we are trying to see if we can get physically the objective is so by, by in maths we are just changing the distances and perhaps the uh, uh, direction of the basis functions. The objective is to make sure that the two, two norm two norm means just squaring everything 
would represent a physical energy like is that clear like we have acoustic energy as a two norm when you write d k by d t of u prime p prime but weighed by some factors you will give the acoustic energy. So, some kind of because to measure growth you need a measure it is kind of trivial statement, but it is a deep statement to you have to measure growth of energy that is what you are looking for in in when we study instability any instability <coughs> we are looking at the see we cannot track all the Eigen vectors there may be in a real system 100 Eigen vector or 100 basis functions 100 Eigen vectors or in a more realistic situations 10,000 or 10 million and, and so on. So, we cannot really look at each of them, but we need a measure why do you need a measure to measure something to measure the growth or decay it is like uh, uh, you have uh, money coming from salary money coming from uh, uh, stocks you have money coming from rent you have money coming from lottery whatever a lot of things <coughs> and the income tax department is caring about the total income and they will measure the total income and put you some tax they uh, whichever way you get it right and uh, so it is something like if it, because they do not want to keep track of individual things and then collect individually 5 checks they want 1 check so something like that. So, we like to it is like why do you need GPA you can have a grade card and then it has grades uh, it has uh, I do not know some uh, 50 subjects you have done or, or maybe more and has a grade associated with it each. Now, human beings do not like this idea we always want to tag somebody good bad ugly something like that. So, we will say ok we will weigh so you have weighing functions there also. So, you can just average or take the RMS value of all the grades right, but no so there are 4 credit courses 3 credit courses lab courses one has uh, 4 another has 3 another has 2 uh, and, and so on and has 1 and then you weigh because they think that if you weigh this way physically it represents how good the student is or, or his performance or something like that that is it or it, it, it is weighing the effort that is going into the courses or something like that. Uh, so, there is some basis and how good your basis is and all that uh, and many times the measure will be wrong because just as I cannot distill you into a number I mean you have a lot of attributes and if when I the moment I say you have a GP of 9 or 10 or 8 I am really losing lot of information right because I had otherwise maybe 50 grades to look at and but we know you just have one number and there is even more important thing the many things you may know which this none of this 50 grades will measure you may be brilliant in something you may be able to you may be very creative and you may be able to do new things you may be very bad at studying old things but you may be discovering new theorems and or making new uh, hardware and engines and so on but this gpa does not measure any of that so so then in that sense if you wanted to worry about those things also this norm is really not a norm it does not account for everything. So, it is really a semi norm or it, does, it accounts only for partially. So, it is important to construct a norm we will we'll speak about it later on in the context of thermoacoustics not in the context of GPS, but uh, it, or it does not measure your expertise in Tamil or English which may be important for your job, but your GPA does not measure it, it GPA just measures how good you are in memorizing and answering or something. So, so, the critically the norm, so a by norm you are actually distilling everything into one number that is because it is our philosophy I want to call you ugly or beautiful or pretty uh, or smart intelligent clever and then I do not have to worry about it otherwise you know you have lot of attributes and lot of color to you, but I cannot keep track of it that is the that is not because of maths or physics that is the human mind. So, with this I call you beautiful or ugly or whatever. So, I have a norm and then I, I or you have GP of 9, 8, 3 whatever and the success of the norm or success of a choice of a norm depends on whether your measure or the norm can measure what you want to measure. So, in some sense what you have is what you get and if you have the wrong choice then you are you are doomed. So, the basis of what is the significance of doing this is what you want and what you want is what you will get ok is that clear it is a very uh, sounds very outwardly very shallow or simple statement, but it is actually a very deep statement I hope you can appreciate it.
if not think about it okay now any other questions thanks it is a very beautiful question. Uh, so uh, uh, if you uh, go back to the uh, plot so we saw there was a region in this figure uh, there was a region which uh, the green is stable and the uh, pink is unstable and the green region below this point to left of here you will always be stable in this region it is like potential instability everything can be quiet on a good, uh, nice day and another day everything can go wrong and you can be here and here onwards everything will go wrong anyway you know some days are also like that that day whatever you do will go wrong some other day whatever you touch will be gold and some other day it could be this way could be that way. So, it is the same here so you have a globally unstable that means anything you touch will break that day and globally stable whatever you do you can go and call the professor an idiot and he would smile at you oh wow, wonderful that is a deep statement you will say and another day whatever you do he will be annoyed and give you a U grade and in between there is a region of it is called bi-stable region uh, I would call from a point of view of life as potentially unstable things can go wrong and it may go wrong but it need not you can survive also. Now uh, so this is actually variation with damping and time delay for a Ricci tube system and here I have plotted with uh, so this is not really life this is a Ricci tube calculation this is time delay and lo location of the heater and but uh, the sum and substance of what I am saying is you have a region which is uh, globally stable that means whatever you do you can burst a bomb and still be stable as long as you do not change the base flow okay let us we have some constraint like that and there are some regions where it whatever any infinitesimal disturbance will blow up that will be globally unstable and there are bistable regions which you are if you have the right disturbance you can mess it up you can go to instability but the right or wrong depend on whether you want to be unstable or stable if you are a theoretician you may like an instability but if you are a uh, engineer you do not like it. Uh, so, if you have some other disturbances you may disturbance may die, die down. So, there are this three regions I hope this is uh, clear and uh, if you have a class after this those of you can leave there is no problem. So, the issue is uh, how do you go to instability in a subcritical regime so that is the uh, that is the question and what is the optimum or most dangerous initial condition. So, if you have uh, 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 if you have uh, there may be some directions some particular disturbance which may be low but just you can get over to instability and maybe some other direction that means you as you mentioned the combination of the basis function or whatever. Uh, so, some other direction along which with which you may need a really large amplitude disturbance to uh, get to instability. So, uh, uh, can a small but finite amplitude disturbance cause triggering ok. So, infinitesimally small amplitude infinitesimally small is your small value you can still find a small value even that should cause instability and even smaller even smaller even smaller anything should work. But uh, now you are we are looking at a case where can a small but finite amplitude disturbance cause triggering. So, this is a simulation this is one of the first calculations we did. So, we start from a small disturbance and I was no thinking that according to linear the theory it should die down it did not die down it it grew and then and decay. Now, I we increase the amplitude of the disturbance a little bit and then it went to a limit cycle. So, we are exciting at almost identical amplitudes, but one actually did some strange thing it, it did a growth and decay I was surprised that a linearly stable system can grow and then decay and then another one which actually went to limit cycle. So, the issue is can a uh, small but finite amplitude disturbance cause triggering and uh, what we will do in next class is we will take a look at the equations and we will look at the nature of the operator in more detail whether it is normal or non normal and we will uh, then we will uh, worry about uh, whether what is the consequence of the operator being normal and non normal and so on. So, I will stop here.